Hi, I'm Jim Rice, Deputy Director here at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. And I want to welcome you to our blockchain and supply chain webinar. Thank you very much for taking your time to join us. I have with me my colleagues, Dr. Inma Borela and my colleague Ken Cottrell. Uh, they are part of the blockchain research team here at MIT. There's also a handful of other folks. Uh, in fact, my colleague over there, Connor, uh, is part of that. And we also have some guests who've joined us. Hain is with us as well. But uh, today, uh, it's just the three of us, and I might drag Connor on, on screen a little bit, um, to talk about blockchain and how it might be applied in the supply chain. And our particular interest here is to help you understand this so far very difficult uh, subject to get a, a good sense of and um, how it actually works and how it could possibly be useful in the supply chain. Um, so uh, before we get started, though, uh, Christine, can I ask you to cut over to the first slide? Well, actually, there we are. Um, we're going to use a device here that that's called Slido. So I'm going to invite you to go to slido.com, and in that, uh, you'll just enter the word blockchain in the box and then click join. And this is going to allow us to conduct some polling and also it's the vehicle by which you could submit questions to us so that we could answer them. And that's really what we want to do today. We want to share some of our own understanding about blockchain, but we also want to find out what is it that you want to know. So that's going to be the vehicle that we're going to have you uh, use. And um, so wh while you're doing that, there's a question. Is that question? Ready yes. To go? Okay. So my colleague Inma has just uh, put that question up. How much do you know about blockchain? So I'll talk a little bit about what our agenda is. And Christine, if you could go back to the, the slides. Okay. Thank you. Um, so here's our plan is we're gonna, I'll first talk about understanding what blockchain is, why there's uh, this great excitement. I'm gonna turn it over to Inma to talk about the applications in the supply chain. Uh, she and Ken will address the several really interesting applications. Um, she'll talk about uh, some of the challenges and then I'll wrap up with the way forward. Now, we are not going to focus on technology. So we're not going to be spending time talking about all the things that um, confuse people about blockchain. At the end of our talk, we, time permitting, we'll spend some time explaining that. But we think that that's really a diversion for what the real important aspect of this is, which is try to understand what blockchain is at its, its foundation and how it can be applied in the supply chain. Certainly technology plays a role, but it's something that I think uh, divert, you know, the, takes people away from real core message. By the way, uh, during the session, please use Slido to submit questions. We'll take those questions real time. We'll actually wait till somebody gets finished with what they're covering on each particular slide. But once we do that, then we'll, uh, We'll, if, there, if we have questions, then uh, when I'm speaking, Inma will pop a question up and say, Jim, I think you need to answer this or we need to address that. And when she's speaking, I'll do the same for her. All right. So um, let's see here. All right. You've already done that. You've already joined. And um, do you want, let's go to the poll. Can you show the poll, Christine? And what we'll see when the poll data pops up as it's just done now you'll see that well, the, the over half of you are telling us that you you have some familiarity a uh, quarter of you know nothing at all and i appreciate that candor um a few of you very few less than 10 percent so you're very familiar with the concept then you're an adopter uh, as we see some of those numbers change i'd invite everybody to try to participate and uh, share that with us but that gives us a a, a uh, a general sense. It also tells us uh, something that uh, I think this is not inconsistent with what we see when we also shows us that no one wants to give this talk, Jim. Nobody <laughs> wants. <laughs> yeah, that's right. For good reason, perhaps. <laughs> All right. So, Christine, if you go over to the slides, um, I'll start talking a little bit about understanding blockchain. So, um, let's start with the very basics and fundamentals. We've broken this out in three different segments because it's important to look at this in, in individually. It is a blockchain is a write once data structure. By that, we mean you write once. So you add data once, you cannot edit that data. Secondly, this, it, it, the blockchain stores the data chronologically, right? So in sequence of 
date of receipt, right? So it's not, uh, it's very structured, and again, by, by, uh, by time of receipt. And the data is collected into blocks. So one piece of data is, is uh, uh, added to a number of others, and it's created into what's called a block. And these are uh, cryptographically chained together. Now, at the end of the talk, you can explain what that cryptographically means, but it, there's an added measure of security and um, again, we can talk about it again, uh, but it it ends up being a growing series of blocks, and that's why it's called a blockchain. Now, importantly, this data structure that stores uh, the data in blocks is used as a distributed digital ledger. Now, what we mean by that, the ledger is really a register of information, so it's really just a list of information that you've you've uh, placed into that. Uh, it's digital in the sense that the data is actually available for you to access. That's different than someone taking an image or uh, uh, digitizing a, a photograph and making that uh, so that you could look at it. This is such that the database, you can actually pull the data out of. Now, it's distributed in the sense that it's, it's shared, so many different parties will have access to that. It's replicated, so it's the same data that's been uh, on, on, on each of the different uh, uh, ledgers, and then it's synchronized again. It's uh, so everything is at the same time has the same data available. Now, uh, the application of th this blockchain as a digital ledger, the distributed digital ledger, gives it the uh, potential benefits. Now, it's important to understand that this all started uh, as a component of. Cryptocurrencies, most most familiarly with us is Bitcoin, but it's, it served as one of the foundational um, uh, components there. But keep in mind that uh, in its application for a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, it was tracking one asset, one type of an asset. And the speed of the transactions was not critical. And so I think that's important as we look at this uh, starting from 2008, the concept was put forth by uh, an entity or an individual named Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know who that really is, could be a group of people, but uh, he described the process that later became known as blockchain. And um, what we see now is a growing, uh, well, as of 2016, a growing number of blockchain pilots in the supply chain that I think are, um, uh, are really only getting started now. I mean, people have been thinking and talking about a lot of it, but just like yourself, only over half of you are somewhat familiar, companies really haven't grabbed onto being adopters. I'm looking at the poll and only 6% are telling us that there's, uh, you're familiar with the concept and are adopters. So question uh, we need to answer, I think, is why all the excitement about this? We've seen excitement about uh, past innovations that um, uh, have, uh, scared people and, and how these new innovations were going to solve uh, every problem that might exist out there. But I would argue that the, there's some excitement for four different reasons. Because of the capability that we believe is an, uh, inherent in a blockchain, because the potential leverage that exists in using that, and because of the appealing philosophy that's underlying this. And of course, because of the hype. So the processing capability is important. We can, as we have come to understand blockchain, we can see this as providing potentially real-time access to data that is nearly tamper-proof. We say nearly because so far, at least in the application of Bitcoin, there, it hasn't been tampered, but uh, there is a possibility of how, of some tampering depending on how it's applied. I think we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we think that probably the big benefit is going to come from when blockchain is combined in use with other innovations and capabilities, such as uh, being a data source for artificial intelligence, um, being a, a data source to enact and enable the automation that might come from smart contracts, um, or using it to uh, pull data in from uh, industrial Internet of Things um, sensors. But more importantly, we get all excited about this because the distributed consensus and open source and transparency and the, the community of this um, makes us think of companies like eBay and Amazon and Google because um, it is, are, it, those companies use those same philosophies to create their business model. So one would then say, well, 
golly, we really need to use this because we're going to be able to have that kind of impact on our business. But I think that researchers have uh, revealed something that's a little more uh, clear. And, and it was Marco Ancianti and Karim Lakani from HBS who introduced this. Could you go to the, oh yeah, I've got a slide, good. Um, who basically say, look, blockchain is not a disruptive technology. It's a foundational technology. And so it's important for us to think of it that way. Think of it as a foundational technology. And so therefore, it's important to think of blockchain really as being just one component that would be combined with many other different components that will create a system that might enable some disruption, um, depending on how you apply that. So um, again, just, just to put some uh, foundation of, around that. Now, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Inma, and she'll talk about, she'll start talking and then transit it over to Ken to talk about the application of blockchain to supply chains. Thank you, Jim. So now, thanks to Jim, we have a clear idea of what, more clear idea of what, more clear, yeah. <laughs> more clear idea of what blockchain <laughs> is. Um, that boils down to its bare basics. It's a digital ledger that is shared by a network and it serves to record data, right? So we believe this technology can have very interesting applications to supply chain management. Um, but before starting to discuss those, I would like you to go to Slido again and answer to a new poll, uh, because we would like to know what is the level of adoption of blockchain in your company. So uh, please start responding to the new poll, and we will comment your, your responses in, in a little bit. If I could just interrupt, I want to say uh, thank you for your kind comments, Josh. I know you're out there. <laughs> All right. So before I start uh, starting to discuss the applications of blockchain to supply chains, we'd like to um, talk a little bit about the application of blockchain to, to businesses. Could we switch to the slides? Please. Yeah, thank you. So um, there are three elements in any application of, of blockchain. We have a network of participants, we have some assets that have been exchanged, and we have a ledger where transactions and other data are recorded. So in public blockchains, some of the ones that uh, Jim was referring to earlier, like the Bitcoin blockchain, the network is open to anyone who wants to join. The assets are uh, money or digital assets, and the ledger is usually uh, public, so the information is available to anyone who wants to consult it. But, uh, of course, business uh, have a different environment. So uh, usually the networks in a business environment are is closed, um, is limited, is formed by businesses and organizations that share transactions and information. The assets are not only money or digital assets, but also physical assets. And if we want to introduce these in a blockchain, they need to be digitized. That is a challenge. And uh, the ledger records relevant data in a business environment, but confidentiality is really, really important. So that's why uh, the concept of private or permissioned blockchains was created. So these uh, private or permissioned blockchains uh, function for a smaller private network where participants need to be authorized. And they are more efficient than the public blockchains because, of course, they're, they're smaller and the consensus mechanisms are, are different. Um, for companies that are starting to, uh, to implement blockchain, they have usually two options. They, some of them are developing their own blockchain using uh, open source blockchain platforms such as Corda or Hyperledger, who are actually offering some um, tools to facilitate the development of this technology by companies. Or they might be using blockchain as a service, using uh, the services of uh, companies like Microsoft, SAP, IBM, or VChain, just to mention some of them because there are many companies now offering blockchain as a service, just like cloud services. Um, so why we think blockchain can have interest in applications in supply chain management? Basically because this blockchain, that is a, a ledger of information, or a ledger of records, uh, presents a single version of the truth. So uh, a single version of the truth uh, can have uh, a lot of interest for a, for a supply chain because several capabilities derive from that. It, uh, a blockchain can consolidate data, verify data, and visualize data all across the supply chain. 
Oh, uh, what do we mean by consolidate? Well, data consolidation, uh, for example, if uh, all the partners involved in an international trade transaction had access to the deal of lading and all the other documents that are needed to uh, carry out this transaction, that can speed up processing time in uh, that specific application. Regarding verification, well, verification of product characteristics can take less time and be more effective if we have this single version of the truth, this ledger where all the information is available, and this can be really important and have a great effect in the fight against counterfeit products. And regarding visualization, if all the relevant information is recorded in a ledger that is available for the network, for the business network, visualizing a supply chain real-time data, real-time situation, can lead to process improvement and also to quick identification of issues, so actions can be taken before these issues become greater problems. Uh, so we would like you to keep these three blockchain capabilities in mind before we start discussing the applications we would like to share with you today that we consider very promising. Uh, the first one is the application of blockchain to improve trustability systems. And the second one is the application of blockchain to improve a streamlined international trade. Before going to the applications, let's see your answer to the poll. So what is the level of adoption of blockchain in your company? Could we show this? Yeah. Thank you, Christine. So uh, one third of you just had non-adoption of blockchain in your company at all. So you haven't seen it yet, or maybe you are considering it. Actually, another third are thinking about a supply chain application, but you haven't tried it yet. And 18% engaged in a proof of concept. So that, that's fantastic. We would love to hear about that. If you want to share some comments in the, in the questions, uh, through the questions uh, section in, in a slide, we will be happy to, to learn more about what you're doing. Yeah, if I can interrupt, I would invite you and encourage you to uh, really take a moment now to share with us, what are the applications? Uh, as uh, Emma pointed out, that around um, just a little bit under 10% say you're uh, piloting or using an application. Actually, it's 15%. looks like you're using or piloting. So uh, we'd like to know what that specific application is. Just uh, send us a brief note in the questions, and that'll be helpful. Uh, for those who are actually applying, then also let us know what are some of the issues you're having. We'll come back and ask you that later on. But while we're at it, just give us some questions. You're in the, in the mix of it. We want to know what the questions are that you're experiencing, the challenges that you're experiencing. It's encouraging that 15% are the using or piloting. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. I, that's yeah. a, probably a little more than I would have expected, right? But that's good. Fantastic. So uh, let's continue. And now we'll start discussing the first application of blockchain to supply chains, that is uh, trustability. So many people are saying this one of the this is one of the killer applications of blockchain in supply chains. Uh, that still remains to be seen, but we, we certainly think it's it's promising. So uh, why is it relevant? Well, uh, trustability is really important nowadays in our increasingly well, in our global supply chains, increasingly complex. Because we, first of all, we're finding in the global market a big problem of counterfeit and fraud. Uh, for example, in the food industry, there's been studies that say that 10% of products in supermarket shelves have been adulterated. That's a huge amount of products. Um, and the food fraud uh, industry, or it's not even an industry, a food fraud uh, represents a market of 10 to $50 billion per year. That's, that's the estimation. So it's really a big, big problem. But counterfeit and fraud is not only happening in the food industry, it's also happening, for example, in the automotive industry, where fake car parts are being marketed uh, all around the world. Uh, for example, airbags or brake pads, uh, rad radiators, and these fake parts can lead to safety hazards for the users that buy them and put them in their cars. There's also health hazards associated to food. Uh, for example, we all remember the E. coli outbreak uh, that happened one month ago here in the US and led to uh, hundreds of cases of sick people and also a fatal case in California. So it's a really serious, a serious concern. And we also have to take into account intangible attributes that are very important uh, for some, in some of our industries. For example, 
the uh, chance to trace conflict minerals that uh, come from uh, conflict areas, areas where like maybe they are used to finance violence. This is really important. It's something that can't be identified in the product itself, but we need traceability and, and um, provenance to be able to get rid of these uh, type of products in our, in our supply chains. So um, this is why traceability uh, is important. We need to improve it. And we think blockchain might be an interesting tool to, to improve uh, the traceability capabilities of, of companies. But can I just make a suggestion here? Uh, so on this particular application, and this is, I think, something that would be worthwhile for everybody to do if you're looking at an application, is to, uh, is to bring it right back to the specific capabilities that we mentioned. I'm going to just jump in and go back to this. So to get that traceability, you really need to have the capability of consolidating that data, right? And that's one of the things that this that blockchain can do. It also gives you the opportunity to visualize and see that in one particular place. Most importantly, it offers the possibility of verification. So when you are uh, trying to trace a product, you want to understand exactly where it's been. Well, these three capabilities are pretty important to a, you know this particular application of traceability. So when you think about traceability, I would say, or whatever your application is, boil it down to what are the particular you know, capabilities of blockchain that you're going to use. Or maybe it's a capability of some other technology or system that uh, enables you to get that. Uh, but, I, you know, I would, don't focus on the traceability, go back to what are the core components that are helping you get there. Thank you, Jim. That's, that's a really good point. Or so, you're just saying that. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, show, let's share, we would like to share some examples of uh, companies and industries that are trying to apply blockchain to, to their supply chains, but specifically to improve traceability. So let's start talking about diamonds. Diamonds are a $75 billion industry, uh, and um, oh, they're pretty cool. We all like diamonds, right? So uh, diamonds just uh, start being mined in a, in a mine in one of the, the um, uh, country producing uh, diamond producing countries such as Australia, Russia, Congo, Botswana, South Africa. Those are some of the biggest producers. The rough diamonds, they're not the beautiful shaped ones, just, just rough stones are extracted from them. They are traded, then they are cut and polished. Uh, the, they get to this, uh, the diamond we know, and then it is ingrained in a, some type of jewel and sold through a retailer. So um, it's a very interesting industry because it has a lot of value, uh, but it only has one processing step, the cutting and polishing. That's it. That's the only transformation that the, the original stone extracted from the mine suffers. So it should be relatively easy to, to trace. And uh, it's a good pilot project to, to try blockchain and to improve traceability. So why is traceability important for this industry? Well. This industry faces two problems. One upstream, that's the, the um, blood diamonds. I'm sure you've heard about them. These are diamonds that are, uh, come from conflict zones. They're used to finance violence. And uh, well, the market, like governments and also industry, would like to get rid of those. And downstream, there's, there is another problem, which are synthetic stones. These are lab-grown diamonds. They look almost exactly like a diamond, and they're really difficult to distinguish from a real one, but their value, they can be manufactured by some sense of a dollar. Uh, so these two uh, threats to the industry uh, can be um, reduced by having good trustability systems. So what are they doing right now? Well, they have the Kimberley process, that is the process that um, seeks to take blood diamonds out of the, of the market, but it's a really like, paper-based and cumbersome process nowadays. And they also have like just paper-based lab certifications for the authenticity of diamonds. Uh, blockchain can create a historical ledger of every diamond from mine to finger. So that's a really powerful uh, tool if it can be applied to this, to this supply chain. Because it can underpin the Kimberley process digitalizing all the data and making it easier and faster to verify all the documents that are needed, all the requis requisites, 
and also they can reduce the <coughs> synthetic stone fraud. Um, the application, how do they do that? Well, they are lucky because each diamond can be um, uniquely identified. They can, a digital thumbprint can be created that is uniquely linked to a specific diamond. They do this with technology that is already available in the industry, such as machine grade color, 3D extract of digital points, um, serial numbers. So they do this, they create this uh, digital version of the, of the physical diamond, and then they can trace it forever. From, they can add all the information of provenance, and then they can keep tracking the ownership of that diamond for years to come. So it's a, a very interesting process, and uh, it's helping to um, provide complete visibility of the diamond from the origin until till the latest owner. And uh, this is not only interesting for the industry, but also for the insurance companies that are ensuring a diamond see a very interesting uh, application like blockchain here. And uh, we, I just would like to uh, finish by commenting that there are like two big industry uh, initiatives one is called Trust Chain and the other one is Tier ACR. And they are competing to become the standard for the industry, but uh, they both know that the initiative of the blockchain for the diamond, <coughs> to improve diamond trustability, has to be an industry wide initiative because to achieve trustability end to end, all the partners or the um, actors in the supply chain have to be involved. So, um, now I will handle it to Well, Ken. before actually, can, can we just talk about this? So on this slide, I, did, I should realize until I just looked at this, you have that little certificate there. It reminds mm -hmm. me that MIT has uh, put all their, uh, the diplomas, put mm -hmm. them on the blockchain. So uh, we get a lot of people who apply to our school and sometimes they, they create their own diplomas from MIT. Uh, so we can actually verify that uh, the applicants who say they're from MIT, we can actually verify their actual diploma mm -hmm. by going on the blockchain, uh, yes. a small little application. Yeah. Worth noting. Worth noting, yes. Yeah. All right. So do you, you want to skip the fish? You know what, we can come back to the so, fish. Yeah, right? I think I'm, I'm going to skip the fish. Okay. Uh, so uh, because I ran out of time, it's me mentioning that this is another traceability application and it's to trace sustainably sourced fish. It's really interesting and we can send you the, the reference later. Or we may, we'll have some time at the end. We'll have some time. We can just go back. We can go back, yeah. Okay. All right. You're up, Ken. Something that we all love, chocolate. So here's a very um, simple, and I stress simple, uh, representation of the cocoa supply chain. Um, it starts with the smallholder farmer who grows the beans and then sells the beans to um, a buyer. It could be a farmer co-op. It could actually be just an independent buyer. Um, the beans are then um, fermented and dried, and the finished beans are then eventually, they could go via a marketplace, for example, but eventually they're bought by a manufacturer who turns them into a product such as chocolate. So I stress it's a very, very simple representation. Uh, the actual supply chain is a lot more complicated. Well, let's go back to the, um, the small holder at the beginning of the supply chain. So um, what is the problem that warrants a uh, blockchain type solution. Well, it really is that when the um, smallholder farmer sells the green beans, let's say to a crop or independent buyer, um, the record of that transaction is very unclear. It, it's often paper. The paper can get changed. The paper can get lost. Um, and there's a lot of corruption in this supply chain anyway. So what normally happens is that the smallholder farmer is undersold. Um, so the, you know, 100 beans that they sell to uh, the buyer could end up being 80 beans when the smallholder eventually gets paid. And there's, because the smallholder lacks a verifiable, reliable uh, record of the transaction, uh, the, buyer, the, the seller has no recourse. Um, and that's a major, major problem in the supply chain. Um, also, because um, the smallholder hands off the beans to the buyer um, and has no further involvement in the supply chain, then it means that the, the smallholder has actually no visibility at all into the supply chain. So that's another issue. Um, a company called Ag Unity, which is a, a, an Australian software company, has come up with a very, very simple solution, which has um, achieved some pretty interesting results. So um, they've actually applied it in, in, uh, in New Guinea and they're applying it 
in Kenya and several other countries at the moment. So um, essentially what happens is that the, the, the smallholder farmer is issued with a, um, a smartphone um, and the smartphone already has the app embedded on it. And when the smallholder wants to sell the green beans, um, the smallholder alerts the buyer, let's say it's a former co-op, that the green beans are ready for sale. The former co-op sends a representative and then the farmer and the representative agree on terms for the transaction. Um, and then the farmer scans a, co uh, a, um, a QA code on the, um, on the uh, co-op's smartphone, a representative smartphone. Uh, the representative does the same for the farmer. And so they both have a record of the transaction embedded on their respective smartphones. And that data is now stored on a blockchain. It's encrypted. It's very difficult to change. Um, and so now the farmer has what has been missing for so many years, which is a, a verifiable, reliable record of the transaction. Um, and so um, and in addition to that, of course, um, they have a system where they can keep the farmer updated as to the progress of the, of the cocoa beans. Because when the co-op takes delivery of the, of the beans and, for example, um, then transfers the beans to the fermentation process, they alert the farmer via the, the smartphone that that's happened. And the farmer can actually track the progress of those beans right through the fermentation process, right to the stage where they're ready for sale. Um, he's alerted when the sale has been completed and the farmer's money is available. So the farmer now has a much better record of, of the transaction, knows when he or she is going to get paid, and has also now um, has some visibility into the supply chain. It's a very, very simple change, but one that's had huge implications for the, for the smallholder and also for the supply chain. Um, uh, according to Ag Unity, um, the pilot joined the pilot in certainly in New Guinea, the smallholders' revenue was increased by, by threefold. Um, and they're now able to invest that money in materials and tools to improve their yield, which will, of course, you know, make the operation more profitable. And then that will build from there. So as you can see, um, it, it's, it's a very specific supply chain uh, blockchain application. It doesn't use a full blockchain solution. It only uses components of the blockchain, which I think, as Jim has mentioned, is going to be a theme that we will uh, um, uh, go back to time and time again in, in this talk. Um, but I think it's a great example um, of where blockchain can actually make a big difference. So Ken, if I would just uh, add to that, I, I agree with you and I think that it's worth pointing out in this particular application, the the farmer, what, we, what really occurred here was using the verification aspect right. of blockchain. Because they used, it's a you know had a paper process, and they um, and then numbers that they put on the paper got changed by the co-op. Right. But by simply using a phone and then uh, using a blockchain to document how many beans they get, the farmer actually gave to the co-op, they were able to actually verify how much they should get paid for. Yeah. And that wasn't happening before. Now that's a very simple application, but what it's enabled is a lot of exciting things, as right. you point out. The revenue went up because they're getting paid for what they actually produced and sold. And then some of them would deploy those resources to forward integrate and to actually Absolutely. get into the, the, uh, the cleaning and the, the, the next stage of the process. So a small little change enabled a bigger one. And I think that's the story we're going to, we're going to start hearing about. Um, but we need to focus on the very simple application of the blockchain in our world right and absolutely. i think that's a great example yeah i mean i think another interesting sort of uh, byproduct of this is is that um the farmer owns the data so so the the, the ag unity system made a decision early on that the farmer should should be the data owner so the farmer has a public key and a private key um and the farmer can give permission for other parties to share that data um which means that in the co-op, the farmer can authorize other farmers in the co-op to share that data, which gives the co-op more leverage. But interestingly, it also means that uh, the co-op becomes a bigger player in the supply chain because the farmers can share resources because they have a record as to who's got what. They, they know what kind of resources people are using. They know who is producing the beans 
and they know that the record that they've got is immutable. And so that is encouraging them to share um, resources, which is actually consolidating the co-op's position in the supply chain. So it, 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 we haven't got time to go into the full benefits, but Jim's absolutely right. And I think the other point to make, Jim, which, which is very important, and this is another point that we've, we've, we've kind of stressed time and time again, and that is that the actual blockchain itself is not the disruptor. The, the blockchain is, is the enabler. And so the disruptions that come later on are almost a byproduct of the of the blockchain application. And that's an important point to, to stress, I think. Yeah, and I think that's what all organizations need to be thinking about it that way as right. opposed to how is it going to disrupt our, our industry? Right. Oh, it, it might change a process. And then when you put that together with a number of other capabilities, whether it's new data from IoT devices or whether it's using AI to, to actually exercise right. that data or analyze that data, that's where the big changes are going to come. Yeah. It's going to be one helper. Maybe to add to that, I, I think that's a really important point. And uh, also in the case of diamonds, and I think in this case too, it's not that blockchain invented the process. The process is there. It's just enabling more right. transparency, exactly. more security. So um, it's just streamlining the processes, improving them. But the processes were there before. Um, now we have a, another application. Do we have time for this? Yeah, we have time. We yeah, have this? yeah, this is important because this, okay. uh, I think most of the folks will probably have a, I think, a little bit closer connection. I think a lot of them have probably heard of this, but um, you're probably all intimately familiar with the, uh, the problems with um, uh, trade documentation uh, that are based on, on a paper trail, essentially, which is unwieldy. It's, it's prone to fraud. It's very, very slow, and because of that, there are lots of potential to, to cut costs. Um, there have been a lot of proofs of concepts um, projects in the past one to two years in this area uh, to try and use blockchain to automate this process um, with mixed results. But the one we're going to focus on today is very new. I think it was announced about maybe a week and a half ago. Um, it uh, involves um, the UK bank HSBC, the Dutch bank ING, and the um, agricultural giant Cargill. And it, it, it was um, a transaction that involved the shipment of soybeans from Argentina to uh, Malaysia. The, 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 the participants claim it's the world's first commercially viable trade transaction using blockchain. That may or may not be true, but I think what is interesting is that they used a single blockchain platform uh, to transact the, the information. Um, and the, the, the platform they used is a Coda platform. It's quite an, an interesting platform. I, I would encourage you to go on their website and just fish around and see, see what, what they're doing. But it's, it's an open source platform that's been developed by a consortium of banks. Um, it, it basically is a way to record the state of a contract or agreement between individuals or organizations. Um, it's not a pure blockchain um, solution as such. In fact, I think you'll find on the website, they, they, they call themselves, or they call the solution a blockchain inspired solution. Um, so it takes elements of blockchain for this particular problem. And again, that, that, that's a recurrent theme that we'll come back to. Um, so um, by using the blockchain, they were able to, um, use digital information as opposed to paper-based information, which meant that they could automate the processes, which meant that they could cut down the time it, it, it takes to actually process the, 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 the documentation. In this case, it was a letter of credit. Um, the letter of credit normally takes about five to 10 days to um, reconcile all the various pieces of information. They did that in 24 hours. Um, and as supply chain professionals, I, I'm sure you're well aware of the kind of um, implications, you know, for example, if you could cut down the cycle time so much, it's possible that you might be able to cut down on inventory. So there's lots of other um, connotations um, uh, that, that come out of, of that achievement. Um, the, the, I think HSBC now have announced that they're now developing other applications. So I think of all the proofs of concept and pilots out there, this one, it seems to us, seems to be one of the most interesting and could over the next year, uh, um, you know, go into a live situation. So it's worth keep, keeping an eye on. So that's another, I think, good example that um, illustrates how blockchain can tackle a very specific problem, but without using the pure kind of blockchain solutions that, that everybody's describing. And as Jim quite rightly said, um, it's important to think not to get too focused on 
what actually a blockchain is comprised of. I think it's more important to focus on on what the solution or what the problem it is that it can tackle and what elements of the blockchain can be brought to bear to, to solve that problem. So. I think we have another... Uh, Should we go to another, yes. another poll? We okay. have another poll. We would like to hear from you. And uh, now the question is, which are your respective benefits when using blockchain? Because of course, if we're listening to us for one hour, because you're interested in, in blockchain technology and maybe applying it at some point in, in your company. Uh, um, while the folks are responding, I just wanted to say to, you know, Eddie asked a question whether we make the slides available, we will. Uh, we, we, I think when, very simply, we can distribute those directly to our partners in our uh, weekly supply chain exchange note that comes out under yeah. my name, but actually Christine does all the work, so thank you, Christine. Um, and, uh, but if you want to get it sooner than next week, please send an email to uh, any one of us. Uh, the last slide, you'll see uh, our email addresses. Of course, you know how to get us through the website. The other thing I just want to say, thank you to Lawrence and uh, Lawrence and Arvind for describing or giving us a little brief information about your application. And then uh, Kevin uh, gave us some, a, a good, interesting example of the honey adulteration. Oh yeah, right. and I uh, right. thought that was a great example, very consistent with uh, the issue with fish fraud, and then uh, just verifying yeah. the providence for diamonds. Right. Okay, what do we got and in the poll thanks here? Thanks to Josh oh. for uh, oh, yeah. Josh. <laughs> saying he likes the presentation. <laughs> That's encouraging. So uh, the checks in the mail <laughs> to Josh. So <laughs> I don't know. If you want to go through the poll, the answers in the poll, or you want to discuss the challenges first? Uh, let's go to challenges. Yeah. I think it'd be so then we end with the benefits. Yeah, we'll have time. Yeah. yeah, a little right. more time for people to respond there. So um, you can still respond to the poll, but uh, now before um, discussing the benefits, we would like to talk about the challenges. So uh, we think blockchain technology is promising for supply chain applications. We showed some examples. There are many more, but of course there are many challenges too, and that's why it's hard, right? And that's why. Most people are still in the pilot phase or just thinking <clears> of the application and not like, not so many are using it in, the day, in a daily basis in their uh, processes. So uh, we try to summarize in six uh, big dots uh, uh, the, the challenges associated to, to blockchain technology and its application to, to businesses and supply chains. There are more, of course, and we are open to discuss them. We just wanted to give you a, a clear, more or less clear idea of what we think are the main challenges nowadays for blockchain adoption. So, oh, my sorry. colleagues, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I would like to uh, make it this more conversational, not just like me discussing every challenge, but maybe each one of us can be commenting uh, one of the. We love hearing your voice in there. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. <laughs> I can start with the first one, but please just jump in. Um, Actually, I was just thinking maybe Jim, oh, yeah. Jim gave us a very, very um, interesting definition of the difference between digitization and digitalization. Oh, yes, yeah. It may be worth just mentioning that, Jim. Sure. So we, uh, right now, there's um, people in, in our world are freely interchanging the uh, use of digitization and digitalization. Uh, I'm informed by uh, my colleague, Dr. Jeannie Ross, over at our Center for Information Systems Research, who has explained that from their perspective, digitalization is different than digitization. Digitization, imagine this. Imagine you have a bill of lading and you want to make that available to somebody. Well, you can send it by courier, right? Put it, print it out, hand it to a courier, courier delivers it. Alternatively, you can take a photograph of it or you can scan it and you can electronically distribute that to them. And you could even archive it someplace. That information is visible. That's different than digitalization. Digitalization it would be if you take the data off of that bill of lading and then make that available electronically to a user. The distinction is that if I sent a bill of lading to uh, the next party in the chain, he or she can look at it and say, I have verification but he or she cannot take the data off of that. They can't actually say, well, how many units are on that? What's the weight of that particular conveyance? And then potentially compare that. With the data digitalized, meaning the actual data components are available, in, our, in the case of blockchain, that's, what, that's being made available, um, that provides a possibility to do a lot of things. You can actually take the data and do something with it as opposed to saying, 
or I have an image of it. Now I have to process that visually and then take the and actually enter the data. So that's a, one of the distinctions between digitization and digitalization, uh, at least the way I'm, I'm thinking about it again, informed by my colleague, Jeannie Ross. And what that also means is that um, some of the challenges uh, exist. <clears throat> you know, we had a question from uh, Pris I don't know, it wasn't Priscilla, it was Amish. Uh, what's the difference between current tech and blockchain? And well, this is one of the things that's the same. At the very base of the blockchain, somebody has to enter that data. Now, if it comes from a sensor, you don't have human intervention there. So there's no possibility of a human mistake, but a lot of data is still entered by hand. And when it gets into the blockchain, you still have that issue of, well, is that the accurate data? Now, the, the, what happens to the blockchain, unlike other databases, once it's in there, it's not gonna change, right? As I remember what I said, it's right only, no editing. So um, that's one of, the, one of the issues that um, human beings can make mistakes or that can be somebody who, purposely puts the wrong data in there in the very, very first part. I, I would like to add something um, because these two are here together because we're facing in supply chains and the application of blockchain to supply chains, we're facing the challenge of translating the physical world to a digital world. And that's where digitization is important because we need to create a, a, a digital version or a digital image or a of a physical good. And that's uh, in that part is important, like the example of with the diamonds, how they were able to create a digital uh, thumbprint of the physical diamond and then introduce it in the blockchain. So that's a big challenge and challenge into supply chains. And that leads to these uh, threats or, or uh, yeah, problems of possible human errors, mm -hmm. human like, mischief, people trying to introduce a wrong thing. Ken, you want to talk a little bit about governance? Think about what we yeah. learned from our uh, event last October. Yeah, I mean, the governance really has, has become a bit of an issue because um, we've got now um, these sort of private blockchains. Um, because as soon as you create something that's private, then it means that you are automatically thinking about uh, controlling who has access to the information. So um, the governance system uh, has to um, uh, address that issue. How do you actually control who has access to what? Um, and in fact, you know, blockchain purists would say that that means it's not a blockchain because essentially you're 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 not making the the, the, the data public. Um, and so th this is a huge issue and one I think that we're still working through. Uh, there are lots and lots of different governance models, and we don't have time to go into them here. But but, but the you know the basic point is that governance essentially means how you control information, and so you have to figure out a mechanism. That is compatible with the aims, with the um, uh, the solution that you're trying to develop, and is compatible with all of the users involved in the community. And it's it's actually quite a major issue. Um, data ownership is an interesting one. Uh, th that came up actually in, in several of the uh, proofs of concept on the international trade uh, front, where um, you had you know several um, parties with different systems, and there's lots of data being interchanged and they couldn't really figure out who should own what data. And that is also a major issue. And as you can imagine, when a blockchain gets pretty big uh, and you get a big mix of, of users, that could become a pretty major issue. So um, complexity, do you, do you want to tackle complexity in that? Sure, yeah, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the blockchain uh, environment right now, even the concept is, is complex because there's so many different understandings of it. Uh, blockchain, digital ledger technology. Um, it's, there's just a mess out there. There's not a lot of clarity. There's a lack of standards in the way we define things, but also in the way that um, these initiatives are being implemented. So people in the same industry are implementing blockchain initiatives with the same goal, but with very different technologies, and they are not speaking to each other. So we're in a moment of, of trial and error of people like exploring, trying to understand what blockchain means, what are the capabilities associated to it, how can they apply it to their companies. But we have to start to like um, clear this mess and uh, have some, some more um, straightforward definitions for each one of, of the concepts associated to blockchain technology. And also it's interesting how some industries are trying to create some standards uh, to um, implement blockchain in a, in a wider in a wider way. 
Well, there's also, uh, there's a handful of different initiatives. One of them is called uh, BITA, the Blockchain mm -hmm. and Transportation Alliance. There's a lot of companies that have joined in that and they're working together to develop some protocols, some standards. And they expect this to be useful in a number of years time. So not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but at some point in the future. But I, I applaud that initiative because they are recognizing that this may have some impact on the industry and they want to get ahead of it. So the ecosystem uh, challenge is, is uh, a very real one. And some, in fact, some people say it's, it's one of the most difficult challenges to, to address in that, you know, the blockchain is supposed to be a system that could be scaled. But when you have a lot of different types of users in the blockchain community, uh, you need to align the various objectives. Uh, you need to align them in, 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 in how they're going to use the, um, uh, uh, the blockchain. You need to align them in how they're going to agree to the governance stru structure. So there's, there's lots of issues there that need to be aligned on. Um, and creating that ecosystem is actually a, a major task. Um, so that is also a work in progress. Um, interoperability, is that something? Yeah, so um, since different uh, companies are, are uh, implementing different systems, uh, interoperability might be an issue. So there are different um, startups working in, in solutions for blockchains to talk to each other and also for blockchains to talk to the current systems, yeah. uh, data, databases, and uh, that uh, the technology that is already implemented in the company. So that's that's a really important uh, area to be further explored. But there's there's a lot of advances. I think things are like coming up every day. Uh, so it's a very um, lively area. And uh, also it's important to, to take a look to the transaction cost and the speed of the solutions that are uh, being chosen to be to solve, uh, to be implemented. In, uh, to solve different problems in the supply chain. And the, the legal obstacles there, um, again, I think there is some progress being made in this area, but essentially, you know, a smart contract is essentially code. Uh, that's all it is. Um, and it's, it's just a way of, of, of executing a contract electronically. Um, but that has all sorts of legal implications. And so if there are different legal systems that have different ways of, of, of uh, acknowledging that system, then that creates lots of uh, tension between, uh, particularly in the supply chain, which by, you know, you know, by definition, the supply chain industry is an international industry. So it means we're having to uh, try to reconcile different legal jurisdictions when we're using smart contracts. Um, there's a lot of work going on to do that. And in fact, there's work even domestically in the US. I think uh, Arizona, for example, is a state that's quite um, forward looking in this area and has, has passed legislation recently that um, is sort of blockchain friendly. Um, but again, it's it's some it, it's an obstacle that's worth keeping in mind when when you're looking at these uh, at the technology. So what I'd like to do is do a, a quick process check. We have about six minutes left, and there are a few questions. But I'd like to offer you the opportunity to tell us what technology questions do you have, if any. Uh, we haven't received any. I, I, we got a couple. That I think we want to answer. Somebody asked about how you can get the supply chain exchange update, which we do every other week. And I just invite you to send an email to me, jrice at mit.edu, and uh, you'll be able to, uh, uh, we'll put you on the distribution list if you're not on it already. Um, but there was a question that our, um, I think Amish asked, and that question was, what do you do when you enter wrong data? The, hmm. Bad data gets in there, and I think that's one of the issues. Great when that happens, there's not a real clear way to unwind it. Connor, is there, you can't unwind it once the data is in there, right? Uh, there's a couple ways you can overwrite it, but you'd have to get all parties to agree to the overwrite later, which if they like the outcome. Then like. Yeah. So it basically means getting everybody who has this distributed ledger to agree to change. And that's one of the reasons why it has this immutability capability, which is there are so many people that have would presumably have access to the data and have this that it'd be very difficult to change. Yeah, but it's a big problem in like pharmaceuticals, for example, because you know the, the regulations can change so you know what do you do to correct that so yeah it's a really good question and and i think there was a um i think it was connor it was accenture if i remember rightly have proposed um software that can actually overwrite or correct an error in blockchain but it doesn't seem to have gone very far uh but I, i'm not quite sure where, where they're going with that solution but there's not really anything out there is there in general, if you can correct it or make changes to it, it defeats the purpose. Exactly. Exactly. So making it so people can tamper with this it defeats the tamper-proof right. purpose. Of it. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Connor Mikowski.
technology expert. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, oh, so I, I want to just take just a, a moment and address the question that Amish asked, which was really what's the difference between a current and uh, current system and blockchain. And I think that we could spend a lot of time on that. I think we've tried to highlight some of those. What I would say is that the current system, in, in many cases, it's paper or it's digitized, meaning the data is not available, although it might be shared electronically. Uh, the systems are generally not integrated. Uh, some of them might be, but they're not always automated. Then the data is not consolidated. And when I think about it, it's really all about the data. It's about making data yeah. available, consolidating that data, making sure that data is the data that was originally entered into that particular uh, the, uh, register and making that data available. So it's really all about the data. So that's a rough characterization mm -hmm. between the current and the future. Now, the question comes back to what we suggested. What can you do with that capability? Um, Erez, thank you for your, your question. But Erez asked us to highlight the, you know, what the relationship between blockchain and smart contracts is. Well, look, smart contracts, if you read newspapers today, they'll, it would make you think that you have to have a blockchain to have a smart contract. That's just not the case. There are many smart contracts that are already in, 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 uh, in use. But what the blockchain can possibly do is consolidate the data and allow that automation from one database as opposed to multiple databases that otherwise are, it's how smart contracts are being used today. Right, right. Any, any comments or thoughts yeah, about that? I mean, smart contract is, it's, it's again, it, in, in many ways the term is misleading, but it, it's essentially code which, which you, you provide an input, some sort of a, you know, this has been delivered. So then the code interprets that and says, okay, it's been delivered. And then it refers to some predetermined rules. Okay, it has to be delivered at a certain temperature at a certain time. If it complies with those rules, okay, it's validated. Uh, let's trigger a response and response could be a payment. It's just a very simple mechanism uh, for, for uh, basically transacting a milestone essentially. So. Yeah. Um, so Josh asked a question, how do you start? And that uh, allows us to go to our, Great question. our last <laughs> slide. Um, and what we would suggest is that you um, become familiar with blockchain. Note that we're not saying, hey, two feet in, you got to create a blockchain team. You have to invest lots of resources. It's not what we're saying. Really try to understand the basics. Uh, you know, keep up with the this, this landscape that continues to change. Um, understand what your competitors are doing, what your peers are doing, and consider joining an industry initiative. We're not saying you have to do that. Consider it. And there's a resource that, it, it, you know, it takes resource time to actually do that. Um, and then consider a use case. But I, I would think that we would agree that we would say, be clear about what it, your objective is. Don't do it, do it just for the sake of having a blockchain. Right. Um, and one of the things that we think could be helpful would be comparing your as is, your current process, with the, the after process or the future process. That will help you to identify what would be different with the blockchain or what you believe would be different. And therefore then try to infer from that, what are, you know, is it gonna be faster? Is it gonna be lower cost? Will it require, will, will it change, will it give you some new capability that you don't have before? Again, come, go back to the original capabilities, all right? Which we talked about are being able to, uh, to visualize, to verify and consolidate the data, right? And then decide, is blockchain what you need? Or do you need a mix of things? Or do you need something that's like blockchain? You know, if you like the idea of a distributed ledger, well, distributed ledgers have been around for a long time. Blockchain is just a type of a distributed ledger. So with that, I think we are right on the money. So um, I, oh, let me see here. Is there anything, anything else that popped up here that we want to, that we have time? We don't have time to drag. Do we do anything yeah. on the? Wait, survey? sir. Yes, and so. Do you want to talk quickly about this, the, the results of this poll? Do you want to go through the poll or through the questions? Let's go to the poll because it's 12 o'clock now, so okay. we have right. to. So interesting response. Most people clearly support greater transparency. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting that, uh, you know, the avoiding intermediaries, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I think one of the uh, from the outset many would say oh well you know if you have blockchain you don't need other parties well i think we we've we've seen this happen a number of times 
disintermediation isn't all that it's cracked up to right. be. And so it right. sounds like there's some skepticism right. or at least not right thinking that that's a, the you know primary benefit. Yeah. The results of the poll, I think, are very much in line with what we said in, in the mm -hmm. talk. So mm -hmm. so it means that you you guys could have given the talk after all. <laughs> <laughs> Although we have a lot of influence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think with that, we need to close up. Uh, before we close, I want to say thank you to the folks who actually made this happen. And Arthur has stepped away, but uh, Arthur Grau, but also but Christine Adams, who's been the, the producer and director. And so do you want to come on camera and say, say hi to folks? So, she's the magic behind the screen. All right. Hi, everyone. She's, she's making Hope it happen. Enjoyed this blockchain <laughs> okay. So and then uh, recognize my colleague, Connor. You want to come over and say hi? And hi, Ian. Come on over here. Say hi. All right. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, I'm Connor. Um, I'll say up there. So, hey, guys. Um, if you guys want to stick around for five minutes afterwards, not you guys, but you guys on uh, the presentation here, uh, I'll answer some of the questions on Slido. Um, I'll reply to them for you guys. So maybe over the next five, ten minutes, post your questions. I'll answer them the best that I can. Great. Cool. All right. Great. Hi. It's Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. So I think we can declare victory, and we're done. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.